Turn in your Bibles with me to 1 John chapter 2. We're going to be beginning this morning in verse 8. 1 John 2, 8. By way of reminder, if you'll remember, we're talking about fellowship. Fellowship in the light. This is really what this book is about. It's evidence of knowing that you are fellowshipping in the light and not in the dark. And he's going to give us a lot of those analogies. But as a child of God, we want to know that right now we're walking in the light and not in the darkness. And he's going to get to that this morning a little bit more. As we close last week, he says uh, in verse 7, he said, Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have heard or have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Now, the beginning he's referring to, I believe, is all the way back in the Old Testament. But then he follows that statement up with, Verse 8, again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Now, I didn't get into it last week because it almost seems like a contradiction, but it's not a contradiction. So we need to understand what's going on. He says, I didn't write you, uh, I write you an old commandment, but now I write you a new one. But it's the same commandment. See, what happens is, is that we have the Old Testament and we're reading it and we're looking at it in the, the letter of the law instead of, of the spirit of the law. Instead of in fellowship with light shining in our darkness. And so, so Jesus comes down, the light of the world, and he walks out this commandment that he's talking about. What commandment is he talking about, Greg? He's talking about love. Our fellowship in love. Fellowship with God. Fellowship in the light. Listen, here it is right now. Do you want to know today whether you know Jesus? Do you want to know today that you're walking in the light? Do you want to know today or do you want to wait till after you get to the throne room and go, Oh, wow, I must not have been doing it right. I must not have been living for Jesus and I thought I was. See, today we want to know for certain that we know God. We don't want, it's too late. It's appointed for men to die once and then comes the judgment. We don't want to know at the judgment seat we had our ladder against the wrong wall. We had our heart in the wrong place. And he's going to get to it. We're not going to get to it today, but he's going to get to that in verse 15 when he tells us not to love the world, not to have fellowship with the world. We're not supposed to be having fellowship with the world. We're supposed to be do, having fellowship, as he talked about in chapter 1, in the light as he is in the light, having fellowship with God. Why did he write for? The main reason is so that you and I would know we're having fellowship with God and not fellowship with the world. And see, there's always an evidence there that proves where our heart is really looking to live. To fellowship. And fellowship is the word koinonia again. Very important word. If you go back to the early church, the early church, how did they build the church? How do you and I know about Jesus today? Because they continued steadfastly. This was their heart, steadfast. What did they give themselves away to? The word, prayer, and fellowship. And then they broke bread. They took communion to remind them, to make them look, where is my heart at right now? Where am I looking at? But it was the word of God, the apostles' doctrine. It was prayer with God, lining our hearts up with what God is doing, and then fellowship. And see, fellowship means koinonia, all things in common with. Who do you want to have all things in common with? Not my will, but thy will be done, God. If we've given ourselves back to the government of God, to the authority of God, we've been brought back by the precious blood of Jesus into the family of God, then we have been brought back to follow God, to obey God, as he just talked about, to abide in God, to live in his abode, his house. Before he says that he doesn't give you a new commandment, he said, in verse 6, he who says, listen, this is our testimony. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, not but the truth, help me God. Yes, I do. I abide in the light. I'm fellowshipping with God. I believe in the blood of Jesus. I'm a Christian. Whatever it says, he who says he abides in him 
ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Well, how did he walk? In love. He was love incarnate. How did he walk? He walked in truth. He was truth incarnate. How did he walk? He walked in the way. He was the way incarnate. How can we do that if we are ignoring fellowship with light? See, he is light and in him there is no darkness. I'm recapping what he's been saying. And if we walk in the darkness, fellowship in the world, and our heart is wrapped around the things of this world, then we're liars. And his light is not in us. And we need to know that today, not tomorrow. It's not going to be any good if our physical heart dies and our spirit shows up at the throne room and we go, didn't know that then. It's too late. The judgment has already come. So for anyone who truly wants to live for Jesus to be covered in the blood, we need to begin to fellowship in the light. And that would be to be in the word, prayer, and fellowship. Having the same mind as Christ. Walking, peripateo is the Greek word, walking just as he walked. That's the mark. That's the, that's the guideline. He walked perfectly before God. So we've been set free by the blood of Jesus to learn to follow to be in the same way with. And you know what is the greatest part about it, I think, is the, the most amazing part. Is that he sent the Spirit back, the Spirit of truth, to dwell in our heart and to light our path. To say, here's the way to go. Follow me. And as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the children of God. So you have to have this relationship where you're talking. And as things go on in life, when you cry out to him, the relationship is built. See, it's upside down from the world. In the world, you think, oh my goodness, they're sick, things are bad. In the world, you think, oh my goodness, they crashed their car, it's bad. But really, in those things that are happening, when you cry out to God, it strengthens your relationship with God. Because now you're learning to depend upon God, to trust in God, you're looking to God, you're asking the Holy Spirit to lead you in those things. But if you just go crazy when something goes bad, you're not looking to God, you're not building your relationship. If you run off when things are bad, you're not trusting in God and letting him build your life of faith or confident trust in him that he's always there. See, he works all these things out for good. He works them together for good. They're weaved together, the good, bad, and the indifferent. No matter how your fickle emotions react to them, the good, bad, and indifferent are being weaved together to, to sew your life together that is hidden in him. And you're becoming more like him daily with that. And so he says that you need to walk as he walked. Well, I don't know how he walked. Then you have to get into the scriptures. And you have to begin to look at how he walked. See, the nation of Israel, the people of God, the, his firstborn nation, were supposed to be walking it out as a witness and a testimony and as a people before the rest of the world. So that they would know what love looked like. They would know what God looked like, what he required. They had the written law, and they were supposed to be living it out in front of other people. And those people were supposed to become jealous and want to know their God because of how good he was to them. But they failed miserably. They failed miserably. They made up their own little things. Like if I go to church on Sunday, and if I wear my best suit or my best skirt, if I uh, uh, help little old ladies across the street, if I do these things, then I'm going to feel good about myself. And it becomes an emotion. It becomes a feeling, and your feelings will leave you in a ditch. If the blind lead the blind, you both end up in a ditch. But we have the Spirit of God who sees into the spiritual realm. We have the Spirit of God as our guide, so we're asking Him to lead us as we fellowship in the light. As we bring everything out into the light, we lay it out on a table, we want to let the Holy Spirit say, good, bad, indifferent, working it all together for good, but you need to stop this and start confessing and agreeing with God that it's wrong and begin to walk this way and be a witness properly. The reason I tell you that the nation of Israel was supposed to be a witness is because in John 15, what does Jesus do? As he's talking to the boys last night of his life, he looks at him and he says, I am the true vine. See, they were supposed to be a vine. They were supposed to be a vineyard. God had planted perfect grapes and they brought forth wild fruit. 
And he said, I am the true vine of Israel. The true witness, the true what it looks like to walk in love, the true example, so you'll know how to walk just as I have walked. And he said, and my father is the vine dresser. See, the vine dresser would come and take care of the vine. The vine dresser is providing everything it needs to bear fruit and be that witness. And if a, if a branch is in me, it should bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. But if you bear fruit, you know what God does? He'll prune you so you can bear more fruit because he's a good vine dresser. You can go read this. It's John 15, verses 1 through 5, and we'll get to it later some other time. But what happens is, is as you begin to grow, you're walking in the light, you go, ooh, that's ugly. And then God comes along, and something that's in your life that's just a sucker branch is what they call it. He cuts it off. See, sucker branches are something that you're doing, something that you're living, something you're giving all your time to. You're fellowshipping with it, but it doesn't produce any fruit. See, you ever see branches on trees like that? They're sitting there. They got all these beautiful leaves on them, but there's no fruit on the branch. So you want to cut those branches off. You want, you want all the nutrients of the spiritual life, Christ, the true vine, to be flowing through you, but not on sucker branches, wasting his time, his energy. We're supposed to be walking circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We're supposed to understand this. As God's people. And so we begin to fellowship only in the place that we know is going to bring him glory, bring fruit to our lives. You know, in, in Israel, when he's going out, and I, and I love this, it's, it's in context, as he goes out of the upper room, before he goes across the brook Kedron and into the garden where he's going to be betrayed, they walk through lower Jerusalem. And as he's actually telling them about the true vine, all of these arbors are there. And you know what the people would do that were taking care of those grape arbors? They would come along and they would clean up all of the, they were wiping off the vines. They were making sure the fruit was nurtured. They're cutting and pruning all of the sucker branches. And if there was fruit laying in the sand, and when it laid in the sand on the lower branches, that, that the sand would cause a fungus to start growing on the fruit. So they would pick it up and they would clean it off and they would take a rock and they would slide it underneath and they would set it back down on top of a rock. It's a picture of our lives as the fruit in Christ, seated on a rock, been cleaned up, seated on a rock, and now we can bear more fruit and grow and the fungus doesn't affect us anymore because he took the power of sin. He took the penalty of sin. And now we can abide in the vine and just sit there as trophies of grace on this rock saying, look at me, I'm the witness because of the love that God has put in me. I get to be a witness. Well, see, that whole process happens instantly there on that grape. But with you and me, it's a slow process as he's washing and cleansing us. Because sometimes we go over here. See, we just have to know that our position is him the vine and we're the branches and abide in him. But if we're not abiding in him, then we're over here. We're not being washed and cleansed. We're growing sucker branches. We're over here. We're doing all this. See, we should be fellowshipping in the light. Get right there where the light can shine. The light can give us its nourishment. And we can grow and bear fruit, some 60, some 30, some 100 fold, according to what he wants to do in your life. So he says, walk as I have walked. Peripateo, it's your general walk. It's how you're living. It's what you're doing. And then he says, I'm not going to give you a new commandment. And i got to read this now because this is our text, okay? And let's just do 7 uh, to 14. And I would love to get into 15 and 16 and throughout, but we, we have to wait and we'll kind of recap next week. And he says, Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. We'll get there. It's Leviticus 19:18. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which then is true to, in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and true light is already shining. Here it is again. Here's your witness. Here's your testimony. 1 John 2, 9. He who says, what's your witness? What's your testimony? He is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. 
He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Father, we pray you would shine your light upon this text. You'd give us wisdom that you would help us to receive with meekness the implanted word for the continued saving of our soul. Pour out your spirit, Lord, and help us to understand what you would say to the church today. And that we would go out and not forget it, not leave it, not allow the, animal, the wicked one to steal it from us. But we would bear fruit, some 60, or excuse me, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold, according to your glory for such a time as this. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Again. I broke this up in a place where we could come back and look at it. Verse 7, uh, no new commandment. But verse 8, a new commandment. Wait a minute, what are you saying to us? And the word new to you and I means I got a new car, I got a new pair of shoes. It's new. See, it's not new. It's the same commandment that's always been there. But it's fresh. It's fresh. Let me give you a fresh understanding of the commandment. <clears throat> is what he's really saying. Look back at John 13. Remember our author is John, the revelator. He wrote the gospel of John uh, some 35 years after the synoptic gospels. And over in John 13, an amazing chapter, which I would love to spend all day talking with you about. We will talk just a briefly here, but I'm not going to go into it completely. In John 13, 34, and 35... Jesus says this, and I want you to see it, a new commandment, a fresh commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Why, Jesus? By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Listen to me. It's, it's really not a new commandment, once again, just as John says over in 1 John, but it's a fresh look at the same commandment now with the Spirit of God, the light of the world shining in the darkness, and man's religion and laws away from it. Look at, hold your finger in John 13, and let me read to you Leviticus 19, 18. See, it's not new. It's the old. It's been from the beginning when he first created his people, and he gave them commandments. What's a commandment, anybody? It's a prescription, authoritative prescription for walking in the light. It's an authoritative prescription for living in God's family. It's the way that he says to live, and then he empowers you to do it. Well, in Leviticus 19, 18, he already told them from the beginning, he said this, you shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Why? I am the Lord. Because he said, because he's God, and he's given us the prescription for life. He's given us an authoritative prescription. Why is that important? Because authority is who is governing your life. Authority is the government of your life. Authority is who you are abiding under, and we're all under authority, or we're in rebellion, and that's sin. So there has to be an authority. So Jesus paid for all of our sin, and he allows us to come back underneath the authority and into the family of God. And now we choose freely to obey and follow. You know, we were singing earlier about choosing the fear of the Lord, choosing the way of the Lord, choosing the word of the Lord. See, because this is really love. Love is not a feeling. We're going to see this in a minute. Love is not a feeling. If you love me, keep my commandments. Does that sound like a feeling? No, Jesus said, if you love me, just obey me. 
He didn't say, if you love me, obey me when you feel like it. But see, we've turned love into this feeling of mushy, gushy, I love that. Well, I don't feel like God would do that in this day and age. Wait a minute. If you love me, keep my commandment. Listen to me clearly. God is the unchanging God. Nothing changes about God. The culture is shifting and moving and dodging and ducking and trying to lead you away into fellowship with it so he can kill you. But God's not changing. He doesn't move. I don't know if you've ever heard the testimony of the admiral who's on his boat and he's out in the waters and it's dark and there's a storm going and, and they see another boat and so they send word, Mayday, Mayday, please change your course by two degrees. And he comes back and he says, No, you change your course by two degrees. Listen, we're on a collision course if you don't change your course by two degrees. And I'm giving you the short one. He says, I'm an admiral in the U.S. Navy. Change your course. And, and the voice comes back, I'm a lighthouse. Change your course. Listen, that's Christ. He's a lighthouse. He's not moving. You choose to change your course, and that's walking in love. You refuse to change your course when the light shines upon you, and that's walking in darkness, rebellion, old age, sin, and it, it doesn't change anything. We've been given the freedom by the Spirit of God, the precious blood of God, to, to turn around and be released from our, uh, our death in hell so that we can now choose every time to obey. And when we choose to obey, we might say, oh my goodness, I want to obey, but I have nothing in me, as Paul said, that, that helps me to do this. So, Lord, I need your help. I just want to turn my heart toward home, and now you empower me to follow. You empower me to obey, because <clears throat> my stinking heart still wants to go there in fellowship, but I need to start putting a plan in mind that's not works, that's not a, a, an old commandment where I think that religion will get me saved, but in the Spirit, being led by the Spirit. See, the Spirit of God wants us all to be in the Word, Prayer, and Fellowship. The Spirit of God wants us to walk in the light as He is in the light. The Spirit of God wants us to bear fruit and it to remain. The Spirit of God is here to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. And to restore us to the place where we're walking in the garden daily with God. And not listening to any other government or authority. Yet we're still resisting. But true love, true walking in love, humbles himself and chooses to follow God when you meet the cross, when you meet the truth, when the light shines on your darkness. You don't make excuses and say, well, that was then and this is now. That's what I started to say. As the truth, as God, as the unchanging one, his word never changes, his character never changes, his truth never changes. The walk that Christ did never changes. The culture changes. Truth in the culture changes. Dress style changes. Music changes. Everything else is changing. But God doesn't change with it. Because he's the lighthouse. He is the course. He is the way. Stay the course. Anchor yourself into his lighthouse. Anchor yourself into his dock. Let him be the anchor of your soul. And when he says, this is evil, then you follow it, no matter what the culture is saying. See, the culture is making everything that is lawless legal. The culture is renaming everything that's sin to make it look like a sickness. The culture is doing everything to move the lighthouse, even in the church. But God says, I do not move. I do not change. I am the example. I am the one that come down. I didn't give you a new commandment. I gave you a fresh look at it by putting my heart in a body. By putting my spirit in a body. By becoming my own son, I walked it out right in front of you. And I died. I poured out my blood for the atoning sacrifice so that you would not only know how, but you'd be set free to do it if you'll obey. And see, what we do is we continue to resist and say, well, that might be for them, but it's not for me. I wish I had a quarter for every time somebody said, well, that's the way Greg looks at it, but that's not the way I see it. It's not Greg. I'm talking about the Word of God. 
He wants us to see a fresh look by looking at the Word of God living incarnate, love incarnate, truth incarnate, the way incarnate, the course, the progress is what the Word means, incarnate, walking with us. And the only way you can do that is by getting into the Word. You can read what He did. You can see His unchanging character. You can see what the Lighthouse has done all the way through the Bible from beginning to end. Prayer, you can begin to cry out to him and lay your heart out before him. Prayer is not a genie. Prayer is not a credit card. Prayer is not getting what you want. Prayer is having your heart conform to his image. Prayer is having your will and desires change to what he's already doing. Prayer is saying, Lord, what are you doing? How do I deal with this? And then he gives you perspective and you know he's working it out together for the good so you can walk in peace and rest that he's got this. But if you never pray, you never learn. If you never get in the word, you never see. If you're not fellowshipping in the light and with his people, we don't grow. And this is what he's trying to tell us is that the body of Christ is supposed to be together. All the pieces are supposed to be working together. One person cannot be a proper representation of Jesus Christ. He's put his entire character and nature into each of us. And then you put all them pieces together. And when they see us loving one another, they know we're his disciples. And they can believe in him. They can trust in him. They can follow our witness and our testimony and come to salvation. You know, when you look at John 13, which blows me away. It's the last night of his life. He says in 13.1, Now before the feast of the Passover, see the, the final Passover he's going to eat, and then he institutes the Lord's Supper, communion, when Jesus knew that his hour had come. See, he kept saying, it's not my hour. What does this have to do with me? It's not my hour. But now he says, my hour has come. The very moment that he's going to be arrested, betrayed, mocked, beaten, spit on, and die for the sins of the world, be buried in the grave for three days, his spirit go and preach captive to the captivities, and, and, and then he's going to raise again and be the evidence. Resurrection is the evidence of his love. It's the evidence he was the true love of God. It's the evidence he was the truth of God. It's the evidence before us that he is the Messiah of God and that he is the propitiation or the payment for our sin nature. His hour had come that he should depart from this world. Where's he going? To the Father. Listen, listen to me. If you're in the way with Jesus, guess where he's at? If you're following Jesus, his spirit's leading you, guess where it's leading you? To the Father's house. Into the Father's presence, seated at the right hand of God. And if you're not doing that, there's only one other road to be on. And that's the road that leads to hell. There's only two roads. There's only two kingdoms. There's only two governments. There's only two ways, no matter how many, no matter how much the, the, the is out there, it's either just like in the garden, let's narrow it down. Let's get it back in really small, right? Adam and Eve walking with one voice. They're allowed to partake and fellowship with everything except for one tree. Got one rule, no. And another voice God allows to come in, another government, another authority. And now you have a choice to make. Not a feeling to make, a choice to make. You don't have a feeling to make, you have a choice to make. Am I going to listen to what God said or the new voice says? And he says, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. And so now if we believe we're walking in the light, we want to know what he said. We know what, he, know what he's done, what he's doing. We want to be able to clearly articulate and hear what he's doing. You cannot do that fellowshipping in the world. You can't do it loving the things of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the boastful pride of life. That's going to be verses 15 and 16 as we move because they're all passing away. They're shifting and moving. God's life, he's never passing away. His word's never going anywhere. It's going to last for eternity. And that's the place we want to anchor in at and fellowship with is his life. Jesus knows where he's going to the Father. Do you know where you're going? He loved, having loved, see, this wasn't an emotion. It wasn't an emotion. It was an action. God so loved the world, he gave. He did something. He didn't sit up on the throne and go, I love them, and just smile. He got off the throne. Watch what happens here. This is what happens in chapter 13 of John. 
having loved his own who were in the world, not of the world, he loved them to the end. To the end of what? To the end of his life. To the last moment. After, and supper being ended, this is the Passover, supper's over, the devil, we know we have an adversary, the other government, the other voice, having already put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. It's in the heart. This is where we go astray. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. Proverbs 4.23. It's already in his heart. He's listening to the voice. He's not, he's not shining light on the darkness. He's following what's in his heart, Judas is, and that's why he ends up doing this. He didn't allow God to do spiritual heart surgery on him with his sword, the word of God. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. Listen, all the freedom, all the prerogative, all the power, all the knowing, he already knows that everything's been handed over to him freely. That he came from God and he's going to God. And then he still chose, not emotions, listen to me. He still chose as an act of his volition, his peripateo, his walk, to do what? To rise up. He rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. Now listen to me because this is a picture of Jesus in heaven, on the throne with God the Father, in his house, and he's already got everything. Nobody can change him because he's unchanging. And he stands up from his throne, and he says, my delight has always been with the sons of men. I'm going to get them. And he takes off his prerogative to his deity, and he puts a towel, flesh, if you will, he's girded in flesh, and he comes down to this earth to get those who will listen, those who will believe, those who will follow. It's the same thing that's going on right here in the last night of his life. He laid aside his garments, took a towel, put on flesh, girded himself in flesh. After that, he poured water into a basin. Type of the Holy Spirit. Why did he do that, Greg? And began to wash the disciples' feet. See, your feet is where you walk. Everything we're doing is about our walk. Where are we walking at? Our peripateo. What's our treading about? Are we going to walk as Jesus walked? Because he'll wash and cleanse your feet every day. Because you're going to go out into this world and your feet, your walk is going to get dirty. But do you come back and fellowship with him and put your feet back in his hands and let him wash your feet? And to wipe them with the towel, the flesh, of which he was girded. See, it's his blood, it's his flesh that died. It's his spirit that was always alive. He was always God, but he laid aside the garment or the prerogative to use his godness. And he became a son of God. He came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Listen, I don't know what's going on in your life, but guess what? If you allow God to have his perfect way with it, if you cry out to him, if you surrender to him, you let him hold your feet and wash your feet, and him be the way you walk in love, after this you will know. And that was the verse I already read to you. 34 and 35. A new commandment, a fresh commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. See, the freshness of it is doing it the way Jesus did it, walking in love. The freshness is allowing the Spirit to lead you. The freshness is doing this in the presence of your enemies. The freshness is doing it when you don't feel like it, you have no reason. Everything's been given to you as a Christian. Positionally, you have salvation. Positionally, you've been forgiven. Positionally, you can believe and stay a child and never do anything, just like Jesus knew all these things, and yet still he got up. See, there's so much more after you say, I believe. In our current text, 1 John 2, if you look there, don't look there, we're here. He starts to talk about how there's children, there's fathers, and there's young men. That's the three stages of our growth is what he's really talking about. 
You can stay a child and stay on milk and never wash your feet. Never choose to get up and love. Never choose to get up and serve. Never choose to get up and lay your life down. But the one thing you won't have is evidence of your salvation. You might be on your deathbed freaking out because you won't know. I talk to Christians all the time. They say, I hope I get to heaven. Listen, you can know. That's going to be the end of this book. I write these things that you might know you have eternal life and continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. 1 John 5, 13. That you know. This is a knowing. My people perish for lack of knowledge, but you can know. You can experience it. You can go. You can grow. You can allow the Spirit to change your life and transform you, or you can do nothing except say, I believe. But God has so much more for us that we grow into young men. We grow into mature men. And literally, in the discipleship process, the younger ones are supposed to be listening. The, younger, or the older women are supposed to train the younger women. Why? Because they've matured. They've been in the Word of God. They've come to know that He's the Christ and He has living water for us. They've come to experience and when we humble ourselves and choose to put ourselves under somebody and listen to them and obey, we're really obeying the authority of God's government and God's word. That's why Paul said, follow me while I follow Jesus. He didn't say, follow me while I go live my life. He said, follow me while I follow Jesus. If he's not following Jesus, he says, don't follow me. Do you understand? No, I don't understand what's going on right this minute. But I know that God's got it. I know He's sovereign. I know He's unchanging. I know I, if I keep looking to fellowship in the light of being His Word, prayer, and fellowship, that He's got me. And my joy is going to be full. And I'm going to have peace and rest. And I can keep growing. And He'll make me exactly what He set out to do. But if I just go running all over and I'm not abiding... If I go running all over, I'm fellowshipping with the world. Number one, I don't have security. I don't know if I'm saved or not. Number two, I'm not going to have evidence. Number three, I'm not going to be a good witness. I'm going to be just like the nation of Israel that was a terrible witness. Every road in the days of Solomon, every road on the planet led into Solomon's kingdom. The wisest man who ever lived that wasn't God. And the people were supposed to be a witness. Like, look at our God. Look how we're living. You know what they did? They go, where'd you get that idol at? That's a nice idol. Let me look at your idols. And they begin to adopt everything the world was doing, and they call it Christian. Oh, yeah, we're going to get your idol. We're going to call that a Christian idol now. We're going to get your, and we're going to call that a Christian bookstore now. We're going to get yours, and we're going to call that. What makes it Christ-like if it doesn't, if it's not abiding in the light, if it's not dwelling in the light, if it's not walking with the light, how is it a Christian? A Christian is Christ-like. It was actually an insult when it was first giving. And today it's not an insult. It should be an insult. But we don't mind being like other doctors or other, you fill in the blank, whatever it is. I want to be like them. No, you want to be like Christ. That's our identity, to be like Christ. That's what the Spirit's doing. And if you're cooperating and choosing to cooperate, we begin to be transformed. Are we going to be perfect? Oh, no. No. Ask my wife, she'll tell you all about my problems. But we're being perfected, and we're choosing to follow. We're putting our heart in his hand. We're getting in the place of blessing and fellowship, and we're looking to be a witness and give testimony of that to other people when they see us, when they hear from us, because when we, he's lifted up, he'll draw all men to himself. Peter said to him, it's verse 8 of chapter 13 of John, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. You know why he said that? I didn't give you that part, did I? Listen, they're in the upper room. They're celebrating the Passover. They're having this celebration. Jesus is the host. See, he's the host of hosts. This is his planet. He's hosting us. You don't have a planet. You don't own a planet. You don't have any prerogative. You don't have nothing but death coming unless you choose to believe in the blood of Jesus. He's the one hosting us on his planet. He's the creator. But he's the host at this dinner, and he's got a special guest there. You know who, he's, you know who the, the, the special guest is? It's Judas Iscariot because Judas is betraying him, and it's already in his heart to betray him. You're born with a heart to betray God. And he 
makes you the guest at the table. And he breaks bread and he wants you to eat. And if you eat it and choose in your own volition to choose to eat that bread, you become part of his family. But if you just say, yeah, I eat the bread, yeah, I believe, I'm a Christian, and you don't eat the bread, you don't obey, then you're a liar, and the, and the light is not in you, and, and, and you're not part of his kingdom. This is what he's talking about. You know, you know what's interesting? No, you know, and we, we did this at the pastor's conference, a great, it was a great teaching, but on the, he's sitting there, it's a U-shaped table, and, and he's not over here where we would put him, but he's over here on this side. He can clearly see the door. And here's Judas, the seat of honor, next to Jesus, right here. And you know who's over here? Our author right now we're talking about, John. He's the youngest. He's about 16 years old. He's right here. Why is that significant? You know what this guy's supposed to do? If somebody comes through the door to kill the teacher, to kill the host, this guy's supposed to take the knife and rescue the teacher. That's why he's there. He's got John, the one that is writing to us, whom Jesus loved, is supposed to take the blade so that Jesus doesn't die. That's pretty insane to me. I'm like, oh my goodness. You put the youngest guy in the room there? He's the strongest. He's the stoutest. He's the one raring to go. He's the one going, ooh! That's why older sheep like me need somebody to disciple. But they also need to listen and be tempered back by the maturity of a grown person. We're going to see it in the text. But you're not supposed to stay a little bitty baby. All of us are forgiven. All of us, you come to Jesus, you become like a little child again. You're forgiven. You get a fresh start. You're born again. But you're not supposed to stay there. You're supposed to begin to grow. You're supposed to want to be in this place of grace. That's what the grace is. John's name means grace. The grace is taking the sword. Guarding the word of God. Protecting Jesus. Being a witness. Standing there first. You're not supposed to stay in Judas's seat. If you believe in Jesus. Or you continue to betray him. For gold or silver. Or the things of this world. We're not supposed to be fellowshipping, wanting those things. And it was bittersweet to him. After the betrayal, instead of repenting, he takes the money back and throws it in the floor. And even those who lied and cheated the false government, they said, we don't want that. That's blood money. We can't take blood money. They knew they had illegally bought him turning Jesus in. They said, we can't take blood money. So what did they do? They took that money and they went out and bought a field, the, 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 uh, uh, a kildama. The field of blood is what it's called. And after Judas went out and hung himself and fell headlong and his entrails fell out, they went and got him and they buried him first in that field. Listen to me. We're supposed to be sitting down in fellowship, eating a meal with God. But we're supposed to humble ourselves in that and choose to obey no matter what happens. Look where Peter's at. This is where we're at. John 13, verse 8. B, Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Wait a minute. Are you washing my feet? Yeah, if you don't choose to let me wash your feet, you have no part in me because you have nothing in you that can become like me. It has to be what I'm doing with my word, my life, my fellowship, my way. I'm the host. At my table. And if you don't let me wash and cleanse your feet with the washing of the water through the word, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, then you have no part in me. That's what he said to him. You know, they're at a feast. They're in an upper room. And you know where he set Peter at? In the lowest seat in the house. The very last seat, the furthest from him. It's right across from grace in the U-shaped table. It's an amazing Teaching, if you ever want to watch it. He set him in the lowest seat. Why? Because he says, if you want to be greatest in the kingdom of God, you must become the least. 
It's upside down. See, the world says you need to be the smartest, the tallest, the strongest. You have to have the most education. You need to have the most money, and we'll make you the head. You can be the CEO and start telling everybody what to do. Jesus says you have to serve. You have to condescend. You have to humble yourself. You have to become the least. Who did that? He did. He was seated in heaven, had everything, could not be changed, could not be helped. You couldn't do nothing for him. If he was hungry, he wouldn't ask you for a sandwich. You can't do nothing to help God. And he took off his garment and come down and took flesh and girded himself. And he washes your feet so that you can be in fellowship back in his house. He gave you a position of honor in the grace. But you have to guard that. Just as John is seated at that table in this last night. And John didn't really know that. And now he's talking about it. It's not a, it, when he told him even in this night right here, it's not, it's not something that he goes, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Because you're going to see in the garden, he's the one, John's the one that runs and they grab his outer garment and he's running away naked because he's so scared. And it's Peter that pulls out a sword, a machaira, and cuts the knife off of Malchus, or the ear off of Malchus. Peter in his own strength He's supposed to be the leader, and he's doing the dumb thing. Because Jesus already told him, no, we, we're not going to live by the sword. If you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. But he wasn't talking about the word of God. Man shall live by bread alone, or shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's how we're supposed to live. So Jesus takes Malchus's ear, he picks it up and puts it back on his head, instantly healed. That's pretty amazing to me. Anyway, so he says, are you washing my feet? See, when they get there into this upper room, the lowest servant, the lowest person, when you would walk through the city, see, there, you already had a bath. If you, get, if you got invited to a party, you would get cleaned up. You'd go to a city bath, you get all cleaned up, you put on your nice, you know, and you go, we're going to a party, we're going to go party. Well, they're all going to this borrowed upper, upper room, and they have sandals on. And they're walking through the streets with sand and dirt. Oh, yeah, and there's no sanitation department, so trash. Oh, yeah, and they have no running water and no bathrooms. So people actually were supposed to take their, their, their dookie out and throw it outside the city, but they would throw it out their windows. So the people that are walking, you're walking in unsanitary conditions. And when you would get to a party, your whole body's already clean. But your feet could be filthy. They could be nasty. They could be really bad. You ever think about that with your walk? By the time you came to Jesus, how bad your life was? Some really filthy feet. And yet he washes them. He promises anybody that comes to him, he'll wash them. Peter's resisting him right here. He says, you're not going to wash my feet. If you resist God washing your feet, if you say, my feelings, I feel like God's okay with this, then you're not choosing to obey what he says. You're not choosing to obey his voice. You're choosing to obey your voice, your feelings, your emotions, instead of the truth from the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. So Peter says, if I do not, or excuse me, Jesus says, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Isn't that amazing that the God of the universe would come down and take the lowest servant in the house? See, not everybody would do this. Just the lowest servant in the house would wash your feet. Why? Because you've got dookie on your feet. You've got all kinds of dirt and trash. Your feet are filthy. So they made it for the lowest servant, the dregs. And Jesus comes in and goes underneath the dregs and washes feet. He washed the servant's feet that was supposed to be washing the feet. That's pretty amazing. There's a movie coming out in 2022, Eating With Your Enemies. This is the love that he's talking about. We're supposed to be walking in, choosing to love our enemies, even when we hate them. Oh, we better get back to our text here really quick, hadn't we? Because he says, oh, you can't hate your brethren. Oh, but I hate them. They did this to me and I hate them. What about all of us that were enemies of God? And we didn't even know it. That while we were enemies, God didn't hate us. He came and died for us. And he, in the last night of the life, the one that was betraying him, it was already in his heart, this is what I'm doing. It's confirmed. He still offered him the bread of fellowship. We learned this in that teaching that in the Middle East, 
You can sign all the paperwork you want. You can have all the contracts you want. That's why you can't make peace with Muslims. That's why you can't make peace with these liars. Unless you sit down and eat a piece of bread with them and they tear it in half, you're still their enemy. See, that's their contract. When you eat food together, when you eat food together, that makes you family. If you're not eating food with God, you're not his family. If you're not fellowshipping in light, you're not really his family. You're in darkness until now, he said in John 1. You're in darkness until now. Why now? Because I just told you the truth, and now the light's shown in your darkness, and you need to know that now. You're in darkness. If you're not eating food with God, the bread of life with God, you're in darkness until this moment. But now the light switch has been turned on, and now you're making a choice to either choose to fellowship with him or choose not to. And that's what happened with Judas in this text. Let me finish reading it, because he goes away and it's dark forever in his life. He could have chosen light, but he made a choice, not an emotion. He made a choice, a free will choice, like all of us have, to go away and choose the 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave, and he never even got to enjoy it. Because <clears throat> when he realized what he'd done, listen, how much is enough? 30 pieces, 60 pieces, 1 million, 2 million? It can't satisfy you. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Chasing everything else will never satisfy you. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So he says, Don't, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I want you to, I want, I want to have fellowship. Come back here. Wash everything. Wash and cleanse me, Lord. Not just my feet, but everything. He sees Peter's pretty, pretty all in. He's either all in or not at all. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you, speaking of Judas. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again. Listen, that's what he did. He came down, poured out his blood, three days in the grave. He resurrected. He spent 40 days speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And then he ascended into heaven and he sat down again at the right hand of the Father, back in his rightful place. That's what he just did here. After he washed our feet, he sat down again. He said to them, do you know what I have done to you? Do you know? Do you have the knowledge of what God has done? Do you understand your identity? Do you understand you're a child of God? You've been set free. You've been brought into a family so you can follow God. Do you know what he's done when you say, I believe? This is what he's saying. Look at 13, you call me teacher, you call me rabbi, and Lord, kurios, and you say, well, it's true. For so I am, that's the name of God, I am that I am, the becoming one. I do not change. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have humbled myself, have, have descended, have came down and washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Now listen, there's churches that actually have foot washing, you know, and you can wash somebody's feet, but if you tell them you're going to have it, they're going to put on new socks and wash their feet before they get here. They might even go get a pedicure first. But it's a lot different than actually laying your life down and loving somebody that's unlovable, somebody that's your enemy, praying for them, washing their spiritual feet and giving your life as a witness and a testimony so that they can see what true love looks like even when you don't have to. But because you know you've been given everything, because you know that you're walking with Jesus, you lay your life down and you wash their spiritual feet by being an example. Not doing works. This is talking about being an example. Fifteen. For I have given you an example. Walk as I walked. John would say again later in his latter years as he matured and he is there in Ephesus, that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I do not speak, speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. It's Judas. <clears throat> he ate bread. He acted like he was part of the family, but he wasn't. He went out and betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Oh, he was partaking. He was sitting there. 
He was eating. I'm family. I, I, but it, it didn't mean anything. Now I tell you before it comes, this is what God does. He tells us the end before the beginning. Listen, if you get in the scriptures, you'll know. You keep watching the news, you'll be full of anxiety, and you'll see what's going on, but you'll have no idea what's going on. But when you spend time with God, you'll know what's going on, and you'll have peace and rest. He says this, I tell you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am. I marked out he. He does not go in that text. It's in italics. It's been added so you can understand the text. You will know that I am, that I am the becoming one. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Do you see that progression? Father sent him, he sent us. If they receive our witness, our testimony, then they're receiving Jesus, and if they receive Jesus, they're receiving the Father. They've come back into the family. That's the chain of authority. If they don't receive you, then they're not receiving Jesus, they're not receiving the Father, and they're going to hell. They're not following God. They're not fellowshipping in light. See, because if you're fellowshipping in light and you're learning to obey God and you understand what he's really done for you when he washed your spiritual feet, you was on your way to hell, then now you're going to make the choice because he first loved us to love others, serve others, not because of your emotions and feelings. And they said, well, she said, and he said, and they said, no, no, no. You're going to do it because of who Jesus is. And you're a witness giving testimony that your life has changed and you're not going to play games in the flesh, but you're going to be serious because this is about hellfire. People are going to hell. So a little bit of, of, of callousness or a little bit of harshness or a little bit of they offended me means nothing. Look how we offended God and he came and died for us. He didn't just come down and go, whoa, 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 if you'll stop doing that, I'll take you back. No, he came down and died so that if you choose to stop doing that, you automatically come back into his family. You didn't even know you were doing that. You didn't even know you were an enemy of God until after he already died. And there's people out there just like us, like we used to be, that still don't know. They still laugh at you. They still mock at you. They still can't understand why you would go to church on Sunday or why you would say you believe in God. Just like we were once. But we're the only love they're going to see. And if we just stop talking to them or stop praying for them or stop going to them, then we don't really love them. We just have an emotion where we don't want to be offended. Emotions is not what love is about. Love is about choice. And if we choose Jesus, there's going to be evidence. There's going to be the Shekinah glory of God following us where they will see the light of the world, will be given witness and testimony that Jesus is Lord. He'll be lifted up. <clears throat> and if they reject you, they rejected him, not you. Let's just read it. When Jesus said these things, it's verse 21 of 13 of John. He was troubled in his spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed, among whom he spoke. And there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. This is John, right side, the grace of God, waiting to take the sword if somebody comes in. Now after, oh, excuse me, and leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Oh, Simon Peter motioned to him, verse 24, and then leaning back. I'm trying to read it real quick so I can get back to my text because we ran out of time. I'll be talking like this for the rest of the time. Jesus answered, good place to make a splice. It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Listen. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box. He's the treasurer. God is allowing him to guard the money of the church. And he's the one that betrayed him. So don't look at positions and go, well, look at the position they got. They must be real spiritual. That's a big mistake. Look at the fruit of their life. Look at the way they're loving. Look at the way they're serving. See, the world looks at position. We're looking for servants because the one with the highest position became the lowest position. That's love. 
in our world, we jockey for position. Once we get to position, then we stop doing what we did to get there. They didn't even know what was going on. This was the reputation of Judas. Everybody thought he was a great guy. He was doing good. And in his heart, he was betraying the Lord. That's why you have to go on what they're doing, how they're living. Remember, he grumbled when they when Mary washed their feet with the oil of spike nard. Oh, what is he doing? This book could have been sold for lots of money. We could have put it in the box so I could have stolen it. They thought that was real spiritual because his heart was concerned about money. God's not broke. We're not worried about money in the church. If anybody's worried about money, then there's a problem. I'm telling you right now, you don't have to worry about the money. God owns everything. Most people think, now, sidebar again, well, if I had more money, I'd be a better Christian. Really? I thought the rich man is hard for them to get into heaven. And you're thinking that if you had more, you would do better? That's upside down. Do and be faithful with what you have, and he will trust you with more. Listen to me. Sidebar, it's not about how much you have. And it's about what has you. Does Jesus own you? If he does, then you choose to obey him when he says go. I don't know how we're ever going to get finished with this. Another good place to splice. Verse 28. But no one at the table knew of the reason he said this to them. For some thought, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus had said to him, Buy these things we need for the feast, and that he should give something to the poor. Having received the piece of bread, he went out immediately, and it was night, dark forever in his life. No more light shining in his heart, because his heart has been sealed with night, darkness. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, there's John's little born again ones. I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Here's the example. Love in humility, by choice, by the Spirit of God, because you're obeying God. You don't love because of feelings or emotions or because you're afraid you might offend somebody. Jesus offends the world. Listen to me. Jesus offends every sinner that doesn't want to believe the truth. But the world wants to tell us if you're offensive, if you say something about my lifestyle, listen, you know that the scripture is, a, a, the commands, the scripture, the word of God is an authoritative prescription. You know why you can speak it with authority? Because it has authority vested in it. It's not because of how you're living or who you are. You just speak the truth and you lay the cookies on the bottom shelf where the kids can get to them and they choose to eat the cookies or not. But it has authority vested in it. It's not because of me or any other teacher. It's because of the authority that's already there in the command, the word of God. It's truth. You can't take the authority away from it unless you twist it and you teach it falsely. A new commandment. Love one another. Oh, it's, it's, it's a fresh end up here, isn't it? Because, see, the nation of Israel had made it look really dull and ugly and like work. And they would go look for one proselyte. And then when they want him to, to the Jewish faith, they would make him twice the son of hell by telling them to keep all these works. Instead of bringing them to God, they were bringing them to a building. Instead of bringing them to a relationship, they were bringing them to a bunch of rules and a bunch of do's and don'ts. Instead of bringing them to a father, they were putting them in deeper bondage than what they already were. And Christ died to set us free to follow him, not to follow the world. That's why next week we'll have do not love the world. Let's go back to our text, 1 John chapter 2, verse 9. He who says he is in the light 
So listen again, it's your witness, it's your testimony, it's what you're saying about yourself, it's what you believe. Do you believe it because of what God's doing or do you believe it because you just think it should be okay because I'm a pretty nice person and hates his brother? It's a pretty strong word, hatred. It means especially to persecute. It means to detest. Now think about it just on, on, on the realm of, of eternity, on the realm of heavenliness. Would God have a right to hate us? We're his enemies. We sinned against him. Uh, oh, it gets worse. We killed his only son when he sent him down to die for us. Not just his only son, but all of his prophets from the beginning. When Cain slew Abel, Abel was the first prophet. What was he doing? He was obeying God. He was bringing a sacrifice. He was worshiping God by obeying, by choosing to obey. So we killed the first prophet all the way through. The devil bit a murderer from the beginning. And he killed the word of God. All the way up to John the Baptist. They cut his head off. And then, here's his son. If we kill him, we can have the whole vineyard. And they kill his son. But wait. Since they were in darkness and they had been blinded by their darkness, they didn't know that when the sun rose, it would set everybody free. If they believed that he was the Messiah of God. See, they were in darkness until now, to this moment. When the light turns on, you're not in darkness anymore. You're making a free will choice to disobey God. That's called sin. If you agree with God and say, I just sinned, that means to change your mind. It means to agree with God with what he's saying about your sin and your lifestyle. doesn't matter what the rest of the church is doing. What is God saying to you? It's a personal relationship. He who loves his brother, verse 10, chapter 2 of 1 John, he who loves, so this is not, listen, this is not, Listen, loving someone is not emotion. I wish I had known that when I got married with my wife because our first year of marriage was hard and the second year was worse. And I say that all the time. See, love was choosing to do what I said I was going to do. That was love. When I loved her and grew in a love relationship, it was because I continued to obey even when I get mad that she doesn't put the cap on the toothpaste. Even when I freak out because she leaves everything laying everywhere. I still love her despite what's going on in her life. I stay with her. I obey her and she obeys me. We submit to one another. That's a marriage. We come into our positions of where God has placed us with a headship. That's love when you stay in the relationship, through the pain, through the suffering. And you can't say, oh, I love them with a perfect love. No, you did not love them because you ran from the relationship. Jesus loved when we couldn't love him. We had, there's nothing desirable about us. Love is a choice to lay your life down. And you grow in love over the years of spending time together. You don't go, oh, I love you. That's what the world tells us. That's really lust. We're going to get to that next week. He who loves his brother abides, lives, abides, remains, continues in the light. <coughs> See, if you really love people, you're going to fellowship with God, and you're going to take what God gives you and go out and give it to others as a witness, as a testimony. So that they can see the light. So that they can wake up. And it doesn't matter whether they beat you or spit on you or yell at you or persecute you. You're still giving the light because you still love them. See, the world wants us to shut up. But love doesn't shut up. They, they told Jesus to shut up. But he was silent. He didn't have to say anything anymore. His light was shining all over them. He was light incarnate. He was the truth incarnate. Everybody that was involved knew that he was the Messiah, but they didn't want to choose to change their mind. They didn't want to change their direction. They didn't want to lose their power. Look at it. You can see the same thing going on on TV right now. They're sinking ships everywhere. That's why I tell you there's going to be a false revival that brings in a false prophet. Just like there is in 2 Kings chapter 10, when Jehu, under the order of God, kills both kings of both nations and both tribes. And Jehu looks like he... And then they go and burn down the t Baal, Baal's temple. And they kill all the worshipers of Baal. And it looks like duh, 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 God is back on the throne. But the Bible says, but he still did not walk away from the sins of his father Jeroboam. 
See, it looks like he's doing everything, but it's false revival. They never came back to God. And that's what religion is. That's what culturanity is. That's what saying, I believe in God, but not walking in the light is. It's false revival of your soul. It's a false resurrection of your life. And it's, you're choosing to do it. Nobody goes to hell because God put them there. They chose to do it. Just like Judas did. Bread was offered. Bread is being offered now to anybody that hears my voice. And you choose not to receive it. And you abide in darkness instead of in the light that's been given to you. Because see, if you abide in the light, there's no cause for a scandal on. That's your stumbling or a trap stick that this devil will throw out there. You ever been walking in the dark and you step on the Lego? That's the word of God. Lego. You trip over something. You hit your toe because you're walking in the dark. Now, if you had the lights turned on, you wouldn't have kicked it. You wouldn't have tripped over it. So when you're fellowshipping in the light, there's nothing to trip over because he's a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. You can see clearly where you're going. Unless you get way out in front of him and then the light's behind you and you're like, I'm walking in the dark out here because I'm not waiting on the Lord. Where are you abiding at? Where are you fellowshipping at? But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks. That's his peripateo. He's choosing to hate his brother. Listen, I am not telling you that people didn't offend you. I am not telling you. But God tells you to forgive them. God tells you, Proverbs 19, 11 says, The discretion of man makes him slow to anger, slow to wrath, and his glory is to overlook, to put away, to cover a transgression. That's the glory of man. You know why? Where's our future? Where are we going? We're becoming like God. What's the greatest feature that you think about God? Oh, he's got really nice long red hair. No, it's not. That's wrong. Oh, he's a real tall guy. No, it's not right. No comeliness about him. What's the greatest thing? His forgiveness. Because I'm going to hell without his forgiveness. So why do I want to forgive people? Because I want to be like God. I'm making a choice in love to forgive so that they will see Jesus the same way Jesus hung on the cross and said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Was that an emotion? No, that was a choice to continue to obey the Father and be a perfect witness and give perfect testimony so everybody watching, even in pain, even in suffering, even in death, he loved the world. It wasn't those nails that held him on there. It was his love for us because he knew on the other side we would be given Redemption and brought into the family of God. And that's what it is with the people that have offended you. If God forgave you, why can't you forgive them? I'm not telling you to go sleep with them. I'm not telling you to go run around with them. I'm, telling you, I'm not even telling you to go have a meal with them. But if you don't forgive people that have offended you, it's only killing you. It's making you stay in darkness. It's making you think that if you, drink a, if you get a bottle of poison and drink it, it'll kill them. No, it's killing you. Your part is to forgive them. Your part is not to hate them. Your part is to pray for them. Jesus knew exactly what was going on with Judas, put him in the seat of honor, and handed him bread all the way up to the moment that he was going out to betray him. And he said, what you do, do it quickly. People are going to offend you. But if you're in darkness... Darkness will blind your eyes if you let that happen. That root of bitterness will, 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 will offend others, and it blinds you. The wicked one wins when you don't forgive. The wicked one wins when you don't overlook transgressions. But we get to be like God. When we extend grace and mercy, when we overlook transgressions, when we reach out in love by action, by choice, even when they don't want to hear it, So then he says, and this is, our, this is, I'm just going to read it, and we'll cover it better next week. He says, I write to you little children. This is little born-again ones. This is the way we all come, because your sins are forgiven. That's the first step. If your sins are forgiven, then there's more. This is the starting line of every person that believes in Jesus. I write to you fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. That's, that's part of the finish line, coming to know not just believing and go, woohoo, I'm saved. But now you grow in that relationship. But the strength is in the young man. Look at the young man. 
I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. See, they're starting to grow and they're overcoming, but he doesn't give you the answer to overcoming until the final line there where he says, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. Isn't that what he told us to do? In verse 6, he who says he abides in him ought to himself walk just as he walks. Well, if you're going to abide, you have to be in the word of God. There's no abiding unless the word of God is the bread you're eating and having fellowship with God. That's what makes you strong. But discipleship is sowed into this. Children and fathers and young men, there's three stages of this, this life. There's, a, there, there's, the, there's the starting line as a child. There's the body of the race, which is a young man. And then there's the end of the race, which is as you get older. But you don't ever retire. You keep sowing into other people's lives. How do we know this? It's what John's doing right now. He's a very old saint sowing into everybody's life. He's even writing letters so people will know that it, he's writing them this. Grapho is the, is the Greek word. He's writing this. He's inscribing it on paper. He's taking the time out to make sure they know that love is not a pleasure or a feeling or something that, that you just go, oh, I love you. Love is an action word. Love is a choice more than it ever is a feeling. If you follow your feelings, you will end up in a ditch. If you really love somebody, you'll choose to obey God, fellowship in the light, and then tell them about the light as a witness and a given testimony. Father, we pray that you would plant this word in our heart. You would build our faith. You give us a desire to go out and walk in the light as you're in the light. That our joy would be full, Lord. And we would put Jesus first, others, and then ourselves last. That we would choose to wash feet of people who don't even know what we're doing for them. We would choose to lay our lives down in love so that they would see. And we plant seeds and water seeds so that they would be drawn by your spirit into salvation. And it would not be about how they treat us, but about how you have treated us with your great love. The example you have laid down for us with your great love. That, Lord, we would be who we are because of what you have done, what your spirit is doing in us, and because we are bearing fruit. And we're growing and going, and we know that we have salvation and that you're coming to take the church home soon. Lord, help us not to believe in a false revival not to believe in a false prophet, prophet, not to be led astray by falseness, the pseudo-Christ that's coming, but we would continue to keep our eyes fixed upon you in a daily walk as you wash our feet. Clean us up, Lord. Forgive us. Baptize us afresh and anew with your spirit and send us out to a dead and dying world. No matter what they say, teach us to love them as you have loved us. In Jesus' name and for his glory, amen. The Lord bless you.